Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought Mr. Carnahan was on our subcommittee, but you should join our subcommittee. It's a good one. Well, thank you for visiting. We'll get, we'll get to Mr. Carnahan. We're not being rude to Mr. We generally proceed in the order of arrival, but Mr. Carnahan's joining us as a guest today, so he's last. He's bats clean up for us today. So. Ms. Gifford. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing and for our panelists. Incredible discussion. My first question is for Mr. Chalk. I'm very interested in what DOE can do to help promote adoption of best practices in building design and also retrofits throughout the federal government. I thought it was a pretty astounding that 80 percent of the energy used by the federal government is used by the Department of Defense. I serve on the House Armed Services Committee, and I'm in particular interested in how we can help the military to adopt best practices in energy efficiency and renewable energy in operations and installations. So can you please tell me how the DOE is working to help promote building efficiency within GSA and also the DOD? Is there anything happening within DOD that might also help inform research at, at the DOE, and what efforts are available for cross-pollination? We have a program within energy efficiency and renewable energy called the Federal Energy Management Program, which is responsible for overseeing energy across the federal government, helping give agencies the tools they need to save energy. And one of the, the best mechanisms we have for that are things called ESPC contracts, which are energy savings performance contracts where, uh, you know, typically if you want to modernize your building or make it more energy efficient, you've got to have upfront appropriations to do that. What this ESPC mechanism allows is private contractors to come in, they specialize in energy efficiency. They will put all the upfront money to switch out the lights from incandescent to uh, fluorescent uh, or change, you know, upgrade insulation. Uh, HVAC systems, chillers, and so forth, they'll put all the upfront capital to, to modernize the building. And then they get paid through the, the actual savings in the utility bill. So that's typically the primary mechanism that the Department of Defense is using, and they're doing a very good job at this. And actually, you're one of the leaders across, we look across all federal agencies at Department of Defense. Uh, is one of the leaders in terms of actual energy saved and in terms of putting somebody in charge accountable for energy management. So they're a very, very good example. Uh, and so what, what our program does is it gives people the tools to do that. One of the specific problems we have, I, I come from Tucson, Arizona, is the heat of the Southwest. And I know specifically, not, well, not just with our, our military installations, but our other government buildings as well, um, we have a real problem in keeping our buildings cool during the hot weather. So I'm, I'm curious about the unique research challenges for the Green, progr green Building Program. Um, is it insulation or I mean, what are, what are the, the real possibilities that we can develop it, when you're talking about a climate that gets to be, you know, 115, 120 degrees? Well, the first thing to do is no air infiltration. And uh, so it, it's about the building envelope, mm -hmm. how well you're insulating it, make sure you don't have thermal bridges and, and conductivity. Uh, but then I think the, the breakthrough could be in, uh, in new cooling technology. And we're looking at several different approaches at the Department of Energy. Uh, because uh, cooling technology has advanced greatly, heat pump technology and so forth, much more efficient than it was even 10, 15 years ago. So if you have a heat pump that's 15 years old, you can, it might be like a SEER 10. You can do a lot better today uh, than that. So, but we can go beyond that to new technology uh, for cooling, and I think that's uh, an area of emphasis uh, going forward for our program, especially in the commercial buildings area. And, and finally, Mr. Chairman, for all the witnesses, one of my great concerns that I have, and we sit through a lot of these committee hearings, whether we talk to NREL or the High Performance Green Building Consortiums and others, and the work that's being done is very impressive. But I think that we need to move beyond pilot programs, pilot projects, and demonstration projects to actually put, put what's being you know, done in little specific areas out on a, on a in it, for the entire building industry. So, it, so if a couple people could please comment on how we go from again these little projects to really implementing a, a more national program. Well, I'll comment just briefly. Um, as we build these alliances uh, in the commercial buildings area, we're building a database 
So every building that's demonstrated will go into the database, how it's used, what its energy use is, and we'll take data on those buildings. So this would be education out there to other architects, other developers, so they can see uh, what's been demonstrated at a much larger scale that goes beyond the research and development. I would just like to add to that. I think that it's really clear that, um, you know, the, the whole question of the um, distribution of technology and the diffusion of technology, again, is very much rooted in understanding human decision-making and, you know, when and why people decide to adopt these technologies. And so, again, I think that the, the social and behavioral sciences need to play an important um, part in in that process. I think Mr. Code had a comment he wanted to add. And uh, I'm one. the air conditioning guy. I can't uh, That's why answer. I figured I'd let I you. can't not answer that question. That. Uh, the first thing you do when you're in Tucson and you're building a building is that you don't build the building the same way you would build it if it were in, uh, in San Francisco. You don't build the building out of all glass with an enormous cooling load. You build the building so it has a less of a cooling load. You use less glass and you use better insulation, and then your, your cooling system will be smaller. It'll cost you less money and it'll use less energy. So the engineering and the architecture is, I mean, that's where it all begins in buildings. When you're building a new building, you reduce the load just by configuring the building of the right materials and, and uh, so forth. Then you're going to reduce the cost and the energy from then on. And Mr. Chairman, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, just a comment. There was a federal courthouse built in Phoenix a couple of years ago, a glass building that is the most probably the most energy inefficient building ever constructed, where the guards that sit down at the entrance in the summer have fans blowing on them, in the winter have little space heaters. I mean, it's a huge atrium that's been constructed. And again, you know, it's a federal building, beautiful by design, but incredibly inefficient and certainly is going in the wrong direction. I certainly agree with you. I'm very familiar with the building, and you are right. <laughs> Those buildings tend to be water inefficient as well, as some of them cool by spraying water into the air in a desert. makes an awful lot of sense. As you know, uh, Ms. Giffords, uh, the chairman of the Tr Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, Mr. Oberstar, has been a passionate advocate of green buildings for the federal government. And, in fact, the stimulus package had a substantial element in that. But it, it's only right that the federal government lead the way, and, uh, and we need to find more and more opportunities. I thank you for the line of questioning. Mr. Tonko, who has